That was the first movement of Songs for the Alone, written by composer and friend, collaborator, uh, Daniel Bernard Remain, who I'm going to welcome now to the program. Hey, Umbi, <laughs> how are you doing? Hi, Daniel. That was fantastic. Thank you, thank you. That was fantastic. It is so great to be in this space with you. Yeah. You know, and I'm... Mutual. Yeah, and I'm feeling, I'm, I'm realizing and feeling that it's a shared space. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not quite my home. It's not quite yours. I'm in Norwood, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. Where are you? I'm in New York City. Oh, you're in New York City. And, of course, we're coming to you via the great Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. and their couch concert series. All right, and I can see people are commenting, which is great and wonderful. Wow. Diana, Jermaine, Brandy, Gina, Cam, Tara, Cohen, uh, we are Sandra, Howard, Jennifer, 
we at Umbi and I welcome you and just want to start Umbi with this notion of what we just heard and what you were feeling. Um, <clears throat> well, I think the, the first movement, um, I sort of hear it like a, like a prayer. Yeah. Um, and then there, these, uh, there's the chorale sort of at the end and right. then a, a little bit of it at the beginning. So I, I definitely hear it um, as, uh, as, as a prayer, not um, for something, but like kind of like a meditation. Oh, like a meditation. Yeah. And, you know, and for everybody tuning in, let me take a step back. First of all, this is a piano set of piano pieces that I wrote for you called Songs for the Alone. There are three movements. Uh, the first movement is called Unjoy, said with a, which you just played, said with a smile. <laughs> the second movement is called um, Unlove, and the third movement is called Unknown, mm -hmm. right? Which we're going to hear in just a bit. But going back to this first movement, um, Unjoy, mm -hmm. you're, you're right. You mentioned something that I thought was really important, that it, you, meant, you used the word corral. I hadn't thought about that. But it does kind of sound like a chorale. Actually, it kind of looks like a chorale. I mean, if you looked at the music, it has a kind of a Bachian look to it, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's just kind of whole notes and quarter notes. And it's, it's a kind of, um, I, I, don't, I almost feel like it's an echo or an apparition of, you know, the music we heard before, you know, the, the main theme of the piece, if you will. Yeah. 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 I can hear that. But I'm so glad you used that word chorale because, you know, like a chorale, um, I think that there is something right now about our shared places, our shared spaces, of captivity, of creation. I would even say maybe of prayer, right? You know, I grew up in a Catholic household. Um, my good Haitian mother, she continues to pray all day long, <laughs> right, particularly at night. And that is something I think about when I think about, you know, my family, my son, Zachary Remain. I see you, Zach. Zach just tuned in, everyone. And uh, that's awesome. Hey, Zach. Um, but it is. I think it is. I think it is about a chorale. It is about something that's kind of uh, sacred and maybe even spiritual, personal. Um, can you expound on that a little bit? Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. But what does this first movement, Unjoy, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to play this kind of music, especially now, right, in the midst of this global pandemic? It's a really deep question. Yeah. Um, what does it mean to play it now? Yeah. Um, well, the whole piece is called Songs for the Alone, and mm -hmm. I think that's something that we're all grappling with individually yeah. collectively and i think um it's definitely one of the greatest challenges is like you're having to confront yourself during this mm. time like um you know for example um if you're an artist and you're not performing are you still an artist you know like who are you when when everything has to slow down or when mm. you're not doing anything and um I think this first movement sort of represents that sort of like nothingness that you are sort of um, staring at. And, yeah. and like even the opening, um, mm. the silences, like the rest, like I feel like there's like this starkness that um, that kind of represents that feeling to me of like entering this kind of like empty space. Totally agree with you. You know, Melanie from Florida, she wrote, this is so cathartic. Thank you so much for this amazing music and performance. Music is seriously missed here in Florida. And for those tuning in, you know, I, I'm the, I like to say I'm the proud product of the Broward County public school system. I'm from Margate, Florida. I was born in Skokie, Illinois, but, I was, but when I was five years old, I moved to South Florida. And um, thank you so much, Melanie, for your, for your comments. And I think that's a really good point about the cathartic nature of this music and about this notion of, you know, Songs for the Alone, the title of these three pieces, was written, I think, BC, before yeah. COVID, yeah. right? Yet yeah. here we are. Right. Can you, you know, it'd be great. I mean, what is life like in New York City? My understanding is that you're in Chelsea. Mm -hmm. um, you're in kind of the heart of it, and by, by it, I mean you're in a part of the country right now, which is a, what, they, what we call a hot spot. A lot of cases, a lot of sirens. Let's be honest with everyone right now, uh, a lot of loss of life, 
right? That during the playing of these songs, people are going to leave this earth and transition. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to be in your space, to be in New York City right now as an artist, as a pianist, as a creative person? Hmm. Well, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say because yeah. it's like it's always changing. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like today? Well, today I distracted myself with this live stream. So. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so, well, we're so glad I, you. Yeah, we're glad you did too. We're glad you did too. So I, I think, um, you, you know what? It, it really does feel like um, distraction is something that helps a lot. Uh, yeah. Mm. In many different forms, whether it's like performing or practicing or creating art or, you know, having a conversation with you because I think if I really sit down and kind of think about what everything that's going on outside of my apartment and outside of my apartment building and thinking about all my loved ones and my family, I mean, I would go totally insane. So yeah. I, I actually haven't been um, following the news as much, um, social media as much, only because I think just for my own sanity, it's better yeah. not to... Uh, know everything. Sure. Well, that's wonderful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. Oh, no. Oh, I no. Mean, how How is it for you, Daniel? I mean, oh, yeah, what yeah. were you thinking when you when you wrote these pieces? Because oh yeah, this was before COVID. This was before COVID. Um, what I was thinking was uh, these pieces originally started actually. Um, I was in the middle of a romantic relationship. You know, I was in love. I was engaged. Um, I was traveling between New York and Boston and Tempe. I te proudly teach at Arizona State University. Um, and I was having to really think about um, not only uh, being in love, but being in trauma, right? Being in my history, thinking about my past, thinking about my present, thinking about my future, thinking about my mother, the loss of my father, my son, always thinking about Zachary. And I just started writing. This is one of those rare cases where this wasn't a commission. Right? This was me and a piano, an upright piano, you know, somewhere in Brooklyn. And I just started writing. And this is what came out. And, you know, the ever, the ever um, witty Howard Schrantz, who are in there, he's saying, uh, is that like gunfight at the OK Corral? <laughs> 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 yeah, you got to know Howard. Um, no, Howard, it's not. I love that. We got to keep our wit, keep our humor during this time, you know, to laugh is to live. Um, but no, it, what I was thinking, to be honest with you, I was, I was um, um, you know, Prince's death was still with me, to tell you the truth. And I kept thinking, if Prince was commissioned by a great pianist, right, what would he write? How would Prince write um, what I feel is, you know, he's such a great singer-songwriter in that great American tr tradition of the guitar, singing and songwriting on the guitar. How would he write something on the guitar and then translate it to the piano? Is that what he would do? You know, even though he was a fabulous pianist. And that's the point. I kind of took this notion of, well, let me think about a guitar kind of comping, you know, boom, chuck, boom, chuck. That's what Howard's referring to. But in all seriousness, I thought about something beautiful and melodic in the tradition of 1980s and 1990s Prince and that great pain. You know, he was a, we forget, as much as he was a musician, he was a husband, he was a father. He was in love. He was, in, he was out of love. He suffered, almost survived, right? But this great legacy of music making and harmony and melody and really putting your um, the, the kind of the deep corners, as Thomas More might say, the great philosopher, the kind of deep corners of your emotions into your music. Um, yeah. So let's, with that note, maybe we should um, get back to the music because sure. I feel like, you know, Umbi, so much of what I love about your playing is that emotion and that passion. You know, so much of what you have to say, I feel like, ends up like me in our fingertips mm -hmm. and in our instruments. I'm going to get, for those who don't know, I'm going to get to violin playing in just a little bit. But um, I think it'd be so great if we could hear the next movement, second movement, Unknown. Yeah. And second uh, oh. is Unlove. Oh, Unlove. And then Unjoy. And, and then, then we'll chat again. Oh, yeah. Unlove and then, and then Unknown. Yes. Is the last movement. Yes. Right. So we just heard Unjoy. We're going to hear Unlove. 
and we're going to end with unknown. I'm not going to interrupt you, so we're going to go from the second movement to the third movement. Keep your comments coming. Um, we uh, from Switzerland. We have a uh, Chelsea. We have Gina. Gina. We have Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. And Umbi, just know we have a lot of people on the line listening and loving and learning. Chelsea, yes, we hear you. Gina, yes, we we hear you. And we're all here together in this shared space of music making, of majesty, and of magic. Thank you, Umbi.
Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Beautiful, Unbi. Beautiful. As we do and as violinists do. Full snaps. Snap in Z formation. Those who know, know. Snap in E formation. Oh, Z for Zachary. Yeah, all right. Um, all right. This is, um, this is beautiful. 20 years ago, uh, the name of the person. Uh, this is not from an album yet. So we had a question. Is this from an album? Unbi? Not yet. A future, yeah, maybe a future album. Future album, yes. So, uh, so because far. Because you wrote this, um, Daniel wrote this really beautiful piece for me, a life-changing piece for me. Oh, wow. Um, in 2014. That's the first time we worked together. This is our second time. And, yeah. And, um, what was the name yeah. of that piece, Unbi? It feels like a mountain chasing me. Yeah. And I've performed it so many times. I think it's like, I consider it my my signature piece that I perform because it's wow. it's so uh, meaningful and it's a yeah it's a beautiful piece and wow. and this was I thought this was written as sort of a follow up to that to that yeah. but I think it was sort of ins had many different inspirations and actually right. I wanted to tell you that Prince did play piano you, you oh yeah that? no no it, wonderfully beautifully yeah I mean, and towards the end of his life yeah. he, while he was um, he knew he was sick yeah. he did have these uh, small concerts and he would play that's right. piano. That's right. Piano and a microphone tour. His last yeah, tour. Yeah, yeah, that in was fact, his last tour. Yeah, absolutely. His last performance was, I can't remember where, it may have been Detroit. Um, not sure. Don't hold me to that, Prince fans. But it's certainly his last public performance, I believe, was um, a, a version of Purple Rain. Um, it certainly was during the piano and microphone tour. And uh, you're right, he had uh, decided that for the first time in his life, right, he was going to do a, a tour as a solo pianist right, and singer. Yeah. And there were moments of uh, pre-recorded, you know, tracks and stuff like that. But really, it was about, virt I would say, virtuoso piano playing and singing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, thankfully, you can see most of, the, of, those, of those tours, or at least part of those tours, piano and microphone, on on um, on YouTube, you know they're out now, um, as well as um, it feels like a mountain chasing me. If if our wonderful audience uh, is so inclined, you can Google search. It feels like a mountain chasing me. Uh, Umbi Kim Daniel remain and a beautiful. There's a couple iterations, but some yeah. beautiful um, renditions of the entire piece we can find online. You can find online. Yeah, and you're right. Songs for you alone is the sister piece or the brother piece. The bad little brother. No, just kidding. The annoying little brother. It's the sibling rivalry of, of It Feels Like a Mountain Chasing Me. Yes, oh, thank you so much. Give a hand to the incredible, I mean, Kristen Page, Diana. You don't know, ladies and gentlemen, but there's all these wonderful, wonderful people behind the scenes pushing this concert through. It's 431 Eastern Standard Time on May 22nd. And um, we're, this is just wonderful. And it's so, Umbi, it's so amazing to hear you play um, this music at this time in this shared space in such a profound way. I mean, I really mean that. As a composer, I have to say there is no better interpreter of um, my music and my specifically my piano music than you, and me, for real. Well, I'm very, very thankful for um, our collaboration and for writing this piece for me. And um, it's always, um, well, I I feel like a little verklept because I was getting sort of emotional like as I was playing this piece. It's yeah. difficult to talk, but um, no, well, yeah, it's, it's a really through. beautiful piece and, and I'm so happy that you wrote it. Well, I, I appreciate that so much. Um, uh, John, um, we're not going to play together, but as my good Haitian mother and father would often remind me, um, I'll never ask you, Unbi, to do something that I wouldn't do myself. <laughs> <laughs> so it's only fair that I play a little fiddle for you, a little what I call my wood box. Actually, I'm going to play two different violins today, a four string and a six string. This first one is called, uh, his name is Charlie. Um, he was born in uh, 1971 in Miami, Florida. He was a gift of a former member of the former Florida Philharmonic. And I'm going to play a piece called Filter. Which, wow, here's the serendipity. I'm going to play a piece called Filter, which is a kind of signature piece for me. I wrote it many years ago. And what was true then is true now. I wrote this piece thinking about the great virtuosic Italian violinist Paganini and the great, virtuos the great virtuoso American guitarist Prince. Hmm. And I wrote this piece trying to combine what I felt that they both did really well. You know? So uh, every note is written out. You have to be really clear about that. 
Um, every note is notated. As a matter of fact, the piece has been played by many people, much better than I'm about to play it, by the way, um, including by the, the great Rachel Barton Pine, the great violinist who I believe has appeared at the Kennedy Center many times. And um, uh, she's actually recorded it, if I'm not mistaken, and she, there's a recording out if you'd like to hear a much better version. <laughs> we, could, we could be humble and self-deprecating, right? Right? But I'm going to give it a go, you know, I'm going to get these fingers moving now. So, Lindy, okay. why, don't you take a, you, why don't you take a rest, and I'm going to play this piece, and then we'll come back, I think, and maybe talk a little bit about it, and I'll play a little Sounds more. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Good, Daniel. Awesome. All right. Now it's just you and I. No, just kidding. All right. <laughs> So this is Filter, I do hope you dig it, and um, um, this is for Prince Paganini and all the people that we need and love and depend on. Thank <laughs> you. 
much, y'all. All All right. Can I get an amen? Can I get a hallelujah? (laughs) All right, y'all. All All right. That's it. That was filter. I hear you. I see you dream. I see you dream. Well, that was filter. And whoo. And I'm going to, um, we're going to bring Umi back. I'm going to bring Umi back and we could talk a little bit about it as I switch wow. instrument. <laughs> wow. You know, you know how we do. Wow. <laughs> you know how we you do. Know, you have this amazing ability to like make your violin sound like a completely different instrument. You know? Oh, I appreciate but then that. But it, it still sounds like a violin. You bring it back. So it's like, it, it's like this really awesome in between state of like. Like, what am I listening to? It's, it's really incredible. Oh, I appreciate that. And before we get to Bernadette, this is Bernadette, y'all. Bernadette is six strings, uh, low C, low F for those at home. Traditional violin has G, D, A, E, right? Uh, this has got two extra strings, a beautiful Nubian queen carved right into the peg, peg box. And on the back, Unbi, it says um, Bernadette. Bernadette awesome. is my, my mother's middle name. Right, everything is serendipitous today, and um, but you brought up something that I do want to take our take our wonderful viewing audience through, and uh, oh Bernadette, amen, yes, and uh, Andrew smoking, yes, yes smoking, but you know filtering is actually a technique. In our business, we call these extended techniques. So, for example, John Cage uh, prepared the piano, right? He was able to put nuts and bolts and screws and chains and all these things in the piano to give it a different sound. Um, specific to that, it was New York City. He, he was working with the great dancer choreographer, Merce Cunningham. He was trying to find a way to extend the natural sounds of the piano by creating, in some ways, unnatural sounds. I'm doing something similar where filtering for me is moving the bow as I play closer and further away from the bridge. You throw in that a little bit of a, you know, Jimi Hendrix like a vibrato. And, you know, all of this to say that these are techniques, right? This is how we evolve our feel. This is how we evolve our musical language, yeah. right? This is how we expand this notion of who gets to say what, when, where, and how. So, um, so I appreciate you saying that, yes, you know, it's, I've always said it's not about the violin for me. It's about my violin, the sounds that I can make, and there's a difference. My violin can sound like Prince. <laughs> Um, because my violin, you know what, Umi, my violin was never going to sound like Joshua Bell. You know, I was never going to be able to play in the National Symphony Orchestra. I wanted to. You know, I was a little black boy in Margate, Florida, who aspired to be on the great concert halls of the Kennedy Center in an orchestra. But my hands couldn't do that, Umbi. Couldn't. So I, the question was, can I still participate in the world of classical music, and specific to that, the world of playing the violin? I think so. And that's the lesson for our listening audience. I think it's about ownership, right? That you can own ideas, you can own your education, you can own an instrument. And Ubi, you own that piano. <laughs> you own it. Right, ladies and gentlemen? Can I get an amen? Does Ubi own that piano, y'all? Come on, respond, hit your keys, right? All right. All right. And look, we always are going to have people that won't agree with us, right? Already I can see some dissent in our chat room, and that's okay, right? And that's really, that's, that's politics. That's called politics. I can tell you there are some, and this is a really important point, I think, that Susan's bringing up, that, um, you know, um, she might not like the way I play the violin. She doesn't like the sounds that I'm making. That's cool. I say, no thanks is cool. I, I, say, I say, thank you. I say thank you for no thanks. You know, my job is to disagree with dignity, to disagree with delicacy, right? That we can have a discourse disguised as infiltration. So let's see if I can win Susan over. Because as I like to say, you know, there's, there's kind of two different types of music in the world. There's music, and then there's music for your mama, <laughs> right? 
So this is going to be music for your mama. This is a piece for, uh, okay, Tommy. Oh, Marissa Voigt, by the way, says, thank you, Umvi. And we've got, we got a lot of amens. We've got a lot of thank yous. It's all good. Um, it's all good. So, yeah, it's, it's a lot of love in the room right now. There's a lot of love in the room. So I'm going to play a piece now called, uh, appropriately, The Loss. It was um, actually commissioned from ESPN. And uh, the commission had to do with, um, you know, what does loss sound like? You know, when a great athlete or a great team loses, you know, what does that sound like? And of course, I'm thinking right now as I'm breathing heavy, right? So much of what we do, Umbi, right? We don't play woodwinds or brass instruments, but we still got to breathe when we play, right? So much of it has to do with breath. So um, this is one of the first pieces I ever composed for um, Bernadette for this six string violin. I'd like to play it for you. And hey, let's let's think about this. Let's think about all the people that I'd like to play this for. This, we've lost people in the course of our conversation. I'm thinking about your mother. I'm thinking about my mother. I'm thinking about Zachary's mother, you know, Jill. Names are important. I'm thinking about uh, Pascal and S Alexandra and my father, uh, Jean-Michel. I'm thinking, Jean-Louis, sorry, Jean-Louis. I'm thinking about uh, Sandra even and Marissa and Neil and Heather and, and Jesse and, um, and uh, Z Zarka. Zarka. And, Zaraka, yes, Hi, Zaraka, Zaraka White. Do you know? Yes, yes. yes. Zaraka, yes. Oh, see. Oh, I just love yeah. this. I just, I love this because this is community, right? We don't always have to agree. We don't always even have to get along, but right. But, but can we share? Can we listen? Can we hear? Um, can we share in the victory and um, understand the loss? This is The Loss, and as always, I hope you dig it.
So that was the loss, and um, oof. let's bring Umbi back. I know what you're talking about. It's, um, you know, and here we are, Umbi. Here we are. one of my favorite pieces, I think, of yours. Oh, I appreciate that. You know, I was wondering, I as a composer, that. you know, how do you feel about, like, what do you think is, like, really different about writing for your own instrument, your, your main instrument, the violin, versus, like, like the piano or some other setting that's, that's unfamiliar? I mean, is, is your process different? Is it the same, or...? Um, it's, it changes. I, I'm, I probably write, I, I know, I write better for the violin, but I, <laughs> I just don't, I can't play as well, <laughs> right? I know more about the violin, I write better for it. I write music that I can't play. The last piece I wrote, Hip Hop Studies, Hip Hop Dances and Prayers, on commission from Rachel Barton Pine, I can't play that piece, hmm. you know? No way. I can't play it. It takes me, take me literally I'm not, I'm years to learn that piece. She learns it in days, you know. But I think that's a good sign. Let's look at it this way. Uh, let's look at dance for a moment, right? That um, Bill T. Jones, the great dancer choreographer, who I was his um, music director and composer and principal composer for many years, he once said something to me that was very interesting. He said, you know, I'm paraphrasing. He said, um, you know, I used to create dances for my own body. And then when he got a company, he realized he was a much better choreographer when he understood that it was not about creating pieces for his own body, but for the bodies before him, mm. right? And I think that's really important, right? And, and, and having worked with dancers for decades now, I am keenly aware when a choreographer is writing something, or is creating something, sorry, that is for their body, as opposed to the bodies before them, the bodies in their company. Um, and it's the same thing. And I'm sure you have the same impression, right? I'm sure that you get a sense sometimes of when a composer is writing something for you or for the instrument as opposed to something that maybe they play really well. <laughs> you know? And sometimes that's not such a bad idea. I think, you know, you, I think you've, you've played the music of Fred Hirsch, right? Yes. Incredible pianist, incredible musician. Can you tell, talk, talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. I think he's the same way. He's written these um, concert works he doesn't like to call them classical works, but his concert works that are um, uh, through composed rather than um, his um, background as a jazz pianist and being more of an improviser. Um, he's written these concert works that he himself doesn't play. And, mm. um, and then I, I had the great fortune of, of uh, uh, making the premiere recording of, of these works. And they're amazing because he kind of transfers his um, knowledge on jazz and, and, and then marries it with his love of classical music and, and it's like his own uh, compositional language but um, he, he also said that he writes very differently it depends on you know whether for himself or for, for somebody else or whether it's for his main instrument versus a different setting um, oh wow well that's really wonderful it's really important we've got a few minutes left and I think we're gonna why don't we do a, we're gonna do three quick things why don't we see if there's any questions or comments from mm -hmm. from our audience our audience not the audience it's our audience mm -hmm. you know we care about you and again we want to say thank you so much to the Kennedy Center and the couch concert series thank you, thank you so much ladies and gentlemen support the arts support the Kennedy Center support the work that they're doing they are supporting artists they're keeping our field going uh, this is a time of um, fear and courage, right? This is a time of crisis and creativity. Um, so we've got a question from Eva. Uh, how are you out here sounding like a cello? Two question marks. And then a violin all at once. <laughs> Emoji. <laughs> um, um, uh, okay, well, uh, so two quick things on that. Uh, I've been playing electroacoustic violin. It's electric and acoustic violin combined for, wow, close to 30 years now, maybe 40 years. Um, and, um, you know, my heroes were Jean Lanc Ponty. My heroes were, um, well, actually Joshua Bell and Prince and Eddie Van Halen and, you know, all these great electric string players. Um, I have custom made instruments or modified instruments. Charlie's actually modified. All my violins are modified. The great Eric Aceto in upstate New York. Check him out, Ithaca Strings. 
Eric Aceto, help, uh, created is the luthier that created Bernadette. Um, there's no other instrument like Bernadette in the world. There are some that come close, but this is the only one like it in the world. And that's how it sounds like a cello and a violin. What you're not seeing are effect pedals um, and a computer. And I'm running my violin through different effects processes, processes and uh, actually also through um, a small amplifier and Pro Tools and all the other things that you can't see just on the other side of, of this um, of this. Um, uh, laptop. Unbi, um, also, lest we forget, you know, one of those movements, you're actually, not, to, not today, but perhaps in the recording, um, you're going to be playing on keyboard, right? I see a keyboard behind you. Yes. And yes. that's, that's yeah. something that we're going to work out. Perhaps right. um, the unknown movement, unknown, might actually be with a road sound on a uh -huh. keyboard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that's, that's um, I think Unbi, Unbi, what I love, oh, and we didn't talk about this also, so It Feels Like a Mountain Chasing Me, the first mm -hmm. piece I wrote for you, okay. is also an electroacoustic piece. I interviewed okay. you, um, and I took your interview, and I chopped it up into an, a, a, a running um, process of narration mm -hmm. in which, as you're playing the piano, we hear your recorded voice talking about your mother and your father and your family. And sometimes we hear multiple voices. Sometimes we hear four of you actually speaking at once. Yes. And it's an electroacoustic piece. It's a multimedia piece in that sense. And again, I hope people can check it out. It feels like a mountain chasing me. But that's I how we do it. I premiered it at the Kennedy Center. Oh, I didn't know that. In the Terrace Theater? Uh, no, on their Millennium Stage. Oh, the Millennium Stage. Out of the foyer. Yes. And it was really, really, really cool because. Actually, I grew up in Maryland, um, oh. outside of D.C., and I, as a child, I went to Kennedy Center all the time, and then I lived in D.C. for college and used to go to the Millennium Stage, like, almost on a weekly basis with, with all my music friends, and also seeing all the amazing concerts that they had um, afterwards. And so it was really cool to play that piece about my parents, and I could see my family, I could see my friends, like I could see all the people that I've known forever, my whole life out there, and it was a really incredible experience that that Kennedy Center was able to um, create. Um, yeah, it was a really powerful experience, and and the piece itself is, you know, each time I play it, it's like a, it's uh, it's a different feeling, but always so meaningful. Oh, that is so wonderful. We have another question from Christopher George. Unbi, how does your preparation change with a work that's never been played versus more popular repertoire? How does your preparation change with a work that's never been played? In fact, this is a world premiere, isn't it? It is. Yes. So Christopher, great question. Terrible host <laughs> here and me, but great question, uh, Christopher George. Um, this was a world premiere, Songs for the Alone. Unbi, how, do you, how does your preparation change with a work that's never been played uh, versus the more popular repertoire? Um, well, I think, I think for a work that's never been played, um, and if it's a work that's written for me and I'm fortunate to know the composer and be able to talk with them and, get, and go over the music together, I think that's how the preparation is different versus like more popular repertoire. So um, I'm, I'm classically trained, so I, I played classical music all throughout my education and my training. And um, honestly, I, 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 I still very much love classical music, but I think preparation-wise, I love um, preparing contemporary music more um, because I think I, I can, even though it's your, like this piece is your piece, but I can find ways to make it my own or I can, mm. you know, whereas like I think a lot of traditional repertoire, there's this like, like unsaid sort of pressure to perform it a specific way. And sure. I think that's just given me so much anxiety, I think, mm -hmm. to, to practice that way and to think that way. So. Definitely, I think for music that's never been played, I can I feel I have more freedom, and then I I have um, more more leeway to sort of experiment. Um, so maybe like this was a world premiere, but the second time I know oh maybe I can do it this way, and, and so it's there's a sense of freedom that's that's um, feels like a like a it's 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 really fun. Yeah. It's yeah. Really fun. Yeah. 
Oh. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're just about out of time, but Umbi, I'm wondering if we can end the way we began, and I'm wondering if you might want to play one more piece from us, for us. Is that okay, by uh, Tanya Leon, is that right? Yes, yes. I mean, is that okay? What do you think? Yeah, sure, sure. I okay. can end with, um, this is a piece called Tumbao by uh, the great Tanya Leon. Oh, tell us, I'm sorry, tell us the title again, one more time. Uh, Tumbao. Oh, Tumbao, there it is. Tumbao by Tanya Leon. By the way, Tanya Leon is a great um, American composer. I believe she was born in Cuba. Uh, she has led the Alvin Ailey American Dance Company as a music director and conductor. She has appeared several times at the Kennedy Center. She is a celebrated pianist in her own right. Um, we, are, we both count her as a wonderful friend. Uh, she really is an American icon in music, and specific to that, classical music. And she's a legendary um, performer and human who is continuing to create really important and vital music. We want to thank everybody for being here today. Please be, come back to hashtag uh, KC Couch Concerts. It's, these are live performances um, uh, um, series um, by the Millennium Stage streaming every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, and all of the information is on uh, the K Kennedy Center website. Umbi Kim, thank you so much for playing for us and being thank here you. and thank sharing. Oh, thank you. So we're going to end with Tanya Leon. I'm going to I'm going to be literally backstage. And for more information on me or Umbi, very easy to find. Just Google search our names. And uh, we're going into Memorial Day weekend. Uh, for anyone who is um, not with us, for anyone who you are with, give praise, give thanks, uh, give love. Um, if you're not in love, be in life. And, you know, um, as we uh, strategize and, have, and continue on this shared journey together, um, we are going to end up on the other side where we can all be together again in peace and in harmony, in good practice, and in, and in, in a shared space uh, where we turn the mundane into magic. Thank you, Kennedy Center. Unbi, take us out.